This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 145th edition of the program. Today is May 31st, and this edition of the podcast is brought to you by our newest Patreon and PayPal contributors, and that includes, from out of nowhere, Hadi Pilati, Jacob Nedemeyer, Jeff Zatchum, Mike, The Crazy Vincent, and Tiffany Namwong. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the program, you can visit humanistreport.com slash support or check out patreon.com forward slash humanist report. So on today's episode, the reboot of Roseanne was canceled after the actress made a racist statement about a former Obama advisor. A new Harvard study gives us a more accurate estimated death toll in Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria. Trump canceled his summit with North Korea, then changed his mind. So I'll try to give you an update on whether or not peace is still a possibility. Spoiler alert, I have absolutely no fucking idea. Nancy Pelosi refuses to answer basic questions at a recent CNN town hall. Bernie Sanders former campaign manager Jeff Weaver reiterates the fact that Bernie is in fact still planning to run for president in 2020, or at least he's considering it. Nina Turner teaches Rick Santorum about human empathy. I'll give you an update on Amy Vilela's campaign. And to no one's surprise, there's another scandal involving FCC chairman Ajit Pai. Snowflake Trump melts down at a word one rapper used that offended him. Corporate Democrats are now boasting about deregulating Wall Street. I'll tell you why they're doing what they're doing and what they have to gain by this. Also, Joe Biden endorses conservative Democrat Andrew Cuomo while simultaneously touting his progressive credentials. And finally, we'll speak with another progressive challenging Dianne Feinstein named David Hildebrand. But first, we'll open the show with a story about Tom Perez and why he crossed the line one too many times with an endorsement of Andrew Cuomo after promising to remain neutral during the primaries. So let's go ahead and jump into it and start with that segment. After the DNC actively tried to sabotage Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign in 2016, impartiality was a pretty big conversation that a lot of DNC chair candidates were having back in 2017. In fact, now DNC chairman Tom Perez had this to say about the need for impartiality back when he was a candidate. And what we need in the chair of the Democratic Party is to make sure that in fact and in perception, every single day, you are fair and neutral. Now, fast forward to 2018, and Tom Perez just violated that philosophy by endorsing conservative Democrat Andrew Cuomo over progressive Democrat Cynthia Nixon in New York's gubernatorial primary. That's what governance is about, results. And you've been delivering results. And you've been delivering results that have made people's lives better. That's why Andrew Cuomo and Kathy Hochul are charter members of the accomplishments wing of the Democratic Party. And that's why I'm proud to endorse them. I'm proud to endorse your attorney general nominee. I'm proud to endorse Tom DiNapoli. I'm proud to move forward with you. So much for impartiality and neutrality. But a DNC official actually responded to controversy that was caused by this by saying, well, you know, it was okay because Tom Perez and Andrew Cuomo, they've been friends for a while. I'm not joking, that's essentially what they stated. Quote, Tom has a decades-long relationship with both Governor Cuomo and Lieutenant Governor Hochul, from knocking on doors for the governor's dad in Buffalo to their work together on fair housing in the Clinton administration to their collaborative work during Tom's tenure as labor secretary. The two have many shared accomplishments and developed a strong personal bond. So according to this unnamed DNC official, well, that endorsement of Andrew Cuomo was acceptable because Tom Perez has a long history and friendship with the Cuomo family. Except that doesn't make it acceptable. If anything, it shows just how problematic conflict of interests are 
in the DNC because back in 2016, progressives were skeptical of Debbie Wasserman Schultz early on because she was the co-manager of Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. So we were worried about her ability to act impartially given her past history with Hillary. And as it turns out, we were right because she was forced to resign in shame because she tried to sabotage Bernie Sanders' campaign. She rigged the primary against Bernie. She relinquished control of the DNC, areas with the DNC that she was supposed to be in control of to Hillary Clinton's campaign. So obviously, we need someone who is going to act impartially. And if you're friends with them, that's all the more reason for us to be skeptical of you. Now, in making this decision, Tom Perez actually put himself at odds with his deputy chairman, Keith Ellison, who came out to denounce what Tom Perez did, saying, according to Politico, Ellison was not on board with the decision. He was not told in advance about Perez's decision to endorse Cuomo, a person familiar with the matter said. Asked about Perez backing Cuomo, Ellison said in a statement, The Democratic Party should not intervene in the primary process. It is our role to be fair to all contestants and let the voters decide. But that is not what Tom Perez did. Now, they're claiming, DNC officials are, that is, that they're not going to be pouring any money, you know, in favor of Andrew Cuomo, but we cannot trust the DNC. They've proven to us time and again that they don't care about what voters want. They only care about what they want. And during the DNC fraud lawsuit hearing, the first hearing, DNC attorneys stated that if they wanted to, they can get in a smoke-filled room with cigars and unilaterally decide who the presidential nominee is. That's what they believe. And so obviously, if they think that rigging it at the top is acceptable, then when you look at these individual races, these gubernatorial, senatorial, and house races, they think that it's also acceptable. So needless to say, what Tom Perez did here is completely unacceptable because if he's willing to come out in spite of the bad optics and endorse one of the most conservative Democrats in the country over a progressive, then what does that tell us about 2020? That we can't trust him to be neutral. Because if someone who he worked with and has been a friend with, like Joe Biden or even Andrew Cuomo decides to run in 2020, what's going to stop Tom Perez from endorsing him over Bernie in 2020? Nobody should be endorsed. But this DNC official said, well, you know, since he has this long-standing relationship with the Cuomos, that's why he felt it was necessary to come out and endorse him. Now, Tom Perez's response would probably be, well, what's going to stop me is the DNC charter. Article 5, Section 4 stops the DNC chair from endorsing a particular candidate. In fact, that individual is not only supposed to remain neutral during presidential primaries, but is supposed to encourage other officials to remain neutral. But see, the thing about that charter is we know that it's meaningless to you. The DNC proved that they don't care about that because Debbie Wasserman Schultz violated it. So if she was unable to remain impartial and neutral, then why should we believe that you're going to remain impartial and neutral in 2020 if you can't even keep your mouth closed during a gubernatorial campaign? So now is the time for all of us to come together and call on Tom Perez to resign. And in fact, I launched a petition on change.org calling on him to do just that. And this is the reasoning I cite. Quote, in 2017, Tom Perez stated, one thing we've learned at the DNC is that when you in fact or in perception are trying to put the thumb on the scale in a spirited primary, that can undermine public confidence in us. It was a comment made to assure progressive Democrats that he would remain neutral during primary elections after it was revealed the previous DNC chair, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, actively tried to sabotage Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. Now, Tom Perez just contradicted that statement by breaking his neutrality promise and endorsing Andrew Cuomo over Cynthia Nixon in the New York gubernatorial primary. Because Article 5, Section 4 of the DNC Charter mandates neutrality and pres presidential nominating contests, Democratic Party voters can't be sure Tom Perez won't violate that rule in 2020, as his predecessor did in 2016, based on him violating his own promise to remain neutral in a prominent gubernatorial race. Tom Perez has purged longtime progressive members from the DNC and reappointed individuals that endorsed him over Keith Ellison in 2017. He promised to heal wounds in the Democratic Party that resulted 
after the 2016 presidential primary, but he's only furthered the divide within the Democratic Party and destroyed what little trust the DNC had left with voters. If Democrats are to take back government from the tyrannical right-wing Republican Party, we need divisive and untrustworthy individuals like Tom Perez completely out of the picture. He must resign now and allow Keith Ellison, his deputy DNC chairman, to take over as head of the DNC. So if you agree with that sentiment, sign that petition, most likely, even if it garners 100,000 signatures, which would be unlikely, but even if it does, is he going to resign based on this petition? Probably not, but we need to still make our voices heard, even if they don't care what we have to say. Because if we can generate enough signatures, then at a minimum, that might garner some press coverage. Maybe Politico or The Hill would cover this petition that is gaining a lot of traction. So we don't, we, we don't necessarily believe this would be something that facilitates his exit from the DNC, but hopefully it garners attention and would maybe get people who have sway within the DNC or even Democratic Party to put pressure on him to resign. Because there's already been internal reports about DNC insiders being fed up with Tom Perez, and now is officially the time for us to put a lot of pressure on him to resign. This is totally unacceptable. We can't trust that he's going to remain neutral, and for that very reason, he has to resign. So we have to get him out of there and make sure that if Bernie Sanders runs as a Democrat, which he likely will in 2020, he's going to have a fair shot. That's all we're asking for is a fair shot. We're not asking for you to endorse Bernie over Biden. We're not asking for you to rig it in favor of Bernie. All we want is neutrality, which is what your charter mandates. And because you are incapable of remaining neutral during a Democratic primary in New York, you have to resign because you've proven to us that you do not care what progressives have to say, Tom. What's always interesting to me is that centrist Democrats never own the fact that they are, in fact, centrist, with the exception of Hillary Clinton. You know, I get accused of being kind of moderate and center. I plead guilty. But individuals like Joe Biden, for example, they are very much centrist, conservative Democrats. I mean, Joe Biden is an individual who voted for the Iraq War. He voted for the crime bill in 1994. He voted for right-wing welfare reform that Bill Clinton signed into law. But at the same time, he still maintains that he is a progressive. And when he decided to recently come out and stump for Andrew Cuomo in New York's current gubernatorial primary, he decided to make the case for his own progressivism and try to sell Andrew Cuomo as being a progressive as well. Now, of course, the reason why he's doing this is because Andrew Cuomo is being challenged by Cynthia Nixon from the left, who's a true progressive. So he knows that if he wants to make himself and individuals like Andrew Cuomo, who are actually very conservative Democrats, appealing to their own base, then they have to sell themselves as uh, progressives. In the 36 years that I sat in the United States Senate, I was rated, depending on these ratings agencies, between the fourth and the seventh most liberal member of the United States Senate. So I take a back seat to no one on my progressive values. No one. Zero. No one. I got involved in politics because of civil rights. I got and stayed involved in politics because of women's rights. I've been involved in politics because of the abuse of power internationally. So I take a back seat to no one. And by the way, Andrew Cuomo has never backed away from his progressive principles, not one single time. That's a joke. Now, the question ultimately, I think, is why do centrist Democrats like Joe Biden not just own the fact that they are centrist? Why risk coming off as disingenuous, which they do, and gaslighting voters into thinking that they're progressive when we all know that they're not progressive? Well, it's because this is a political calculation. Joe Biden knows that the Democratic Party's left-wing base, by and large, is very progressive when you look at policy issues, public polling specifically. Now, the reason why at face value, someone like Andrew Cuomo might be misinterpreted as someone who is a progressive 
is because he comes out in favor of pretty bold progressive policies, but at the same time, behind the scenes, he's doing things to make sure that those bold progressive policies he purports to support never pass, never see the light of day. On paper, New York is a solidly blue state. Over 60% of voters chose Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama in the past three presidential elections, and the lower house of the state legislature has a solid Democratic majority. But a corrupt system of bipartisan collusion ensures Republican control of the upper chamber, and Cuomo encourages and benefits from this manufactured partisan split. It's an open secret in Albany that Cuomo is committed to maintaining Republican control of the state Senate, where creative redistricting deliberately gives the upstate GOP minority an advantage. The governor could have used his veto power of redistricting maps in 2012 or used some of his vast campaign resources to elect a stronger Democratic majority in the upper chamber. Instead, he has carefully maintained this structural barrier to the passage of progressive bills. But gerrymandering alone isn't enough to give the Republicans effective power over Albany's agenda. For that, we can thank the Independent Democratic Conference, a group of eight Democratic senators who broke away from the Democratic caucus to forge a power-sharing agreement with Republicans. In 2012, after Democrats claimed a slim majority in the upper house, four of those Democrats, Jeffrey Klein, Diane Savino, David Valeski, and David Carlucci, agreed to caucus with the Republicans, giving the GOP the majority. Since then, the IDC has doubled in size and remained loyal to the Republicans. This arrangement benefits all the key political players above all, Cuomo and his presidential ambitions. Senate Republicans can control redistricting and enjoy the perks and resources of majority status, including the ability to control New York State's over $150 billion budget. IDC members get pork for their districts, stipends for chairing committees, bigger budgets, expanded staff, and access to big centrist Democratic donors such as charter schools, real estate interests, and hedge funds. Cuomo continues to cut spending and prevent tax increases, particularly on high income and property taxes, to appease donors, and casts himself as a moderate progressive who gets things done. Meanwhile, Democrats in the Assembly and Senate can take strong left liberal positions on a number of social democratic bills like single payer, knowing full well that the Senate Majority Leader will never allow it to leave the committee for a floor vote. Now, that is why Andrew Cuomo is not a progressive at all. And that's incredibly shady. It shows that he is not there because he cares about the people. He's in power for self-serving reasons. It's to bolster his own career. It's because he has ambitions, bigger ambitions, perhaps to run in 2020. But we know that if he were to ever be elected president, hopefully that never happens, he would do everything in his power to make sure that Republicans hang on to control of at least the Senate or House so we can take really bold progressive policy stances and never have to worry about signing them into law because he's not in favor of them because he takes money from all of these special interests that aren't in favor of these policies so he wouldn't want to violate what they want. So instead, he walks this really fine line in coming out in favor of these policies to appease the base, but making sure that those policies never get codified into law. It's so, so despicable. Now, if you tune into Secular Talk, he actually lives in New York, and Kyle talks about how there was a corruption panel that Andrew Cuomo was in favor of, but actually decided to abolish once they started to look into his own corruption. This is not just a conservative Democrat. This is a very corrupt Democrat. But it's very telling that... Members of the Democratic Party establishment like Joe Biden and Tom Perez are jumping over themselves to endorse Andrew Cuomo when the optics of this show that the Democratic Party, they're really not committed to progressive policies if they can support someone like Andrew Cuomo over someone like Cynthia Nixon, who is clearly a true progressive. But getting back to the original question that was posed, which is why, you know, these centrist Democrats have to market themselves as progressives, it's because they know that that's the only way they can win. It's bullshit, though. Everyone knows that they're not progressives. Uh, Joe Biden is not a progressive. He touts his voting record, and I also see this come up with Hillary Clinton, how if you compare... Hillary Clinton's voting record to Bernie Sanders' voting record, well, above 90% of the time, you know, they vote the same way. But you're not looking at that 10% of the time. I, I think it's a gross oversimplification because policies have different levels of salience. That varies. 
So something could be not too important and something could be really important that Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden took the wrong side of. For example, the Iraq War, the crime bill. Hillary Clinton didn't vote for that, but certainly she lobbied for it as first lady. Heavily so. So, I mean, Democrats, they try to pretend that they're progressive and they tout their voting record, but when you really dive into the details, you can see these are not progressives. These are opportunists who will say whatever they need to to get elected. And that's what Joe Biden is. That's what Andrew Cuomo is. And if you truly know about politics, you wouldn't fall for it. You'd go for the progressive. And that is Cynthia Nixon in this case. So Bernie Sanders, former campaign manager Jeff Weaver, recently reiterated what Bernie Sanders has already said previously, that yes, he is in fact considering another presidential run in 2020. So I want to talk about that, but there's something else that is really interesting about this article in particular uh, with respect to how Bernie Sanders holds up against Donald Trump in hypothetical matchups. So according to Alexandra Hutzler of Newsweek, the campaign manager for Bernie Sanders in his 2016 presidential run hinted that the independent senator from Vermont may run for the White House again in 2020. Sanders is considering another run for the presidency, but for now is completely focused on his congressional re-election campaign in November, Jeff Weaver said in an interview with C-SPAN host John McArdle on Monday. Sanders made waves as the progressive who consistently challenged former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in his 2016 primary bid. His platform largely focused on issues like universal health care and income inequality. When Sanders announced his candidacy for president in 2015, he was 50 points behind Clinton in almost every major national poll, but with his popularity among young Democratic voters, he closed that gap and ended up winning 22 states and about 45% of the pledged delegates before conceding and endorsing Clinton at the Democratic National Convention. One of the reasons why he was so successful in 2016 was that people out in the country sensed, rightly, that he was an authentic messenger for the message he was delivering, Weaver told McArdle during the interview. Though there are still six months until the midterm elections, America is already looking forward to possible 2020 presidential runs. New polling conducted by CNN shows that in a one-on-one -on -one matchup between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, Sanders is already a leading candidate, beating Trump by a 55-42% to 42 margin among registered voters. First, though, Sanders would have to navigate a Democratic primary, while politicians have yet to officially declare their campaigns for 2020. It is rumored that popular figures like Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator Cory Booker may be in the mix. So as it stands, Bernie Sanders is still defeating Donald Trump in hypothetical matchups by a margin of more than 10 points. So really, that lead he has over Trump has remained consistent since other polls were taken in 2016. And if he could hold the same lead in two years, maybe he could lead that same lead, or hold that same lead, rather, uh, for another two years. So this is really, really exciting to me. And I think that as the 2020 Democratic Party primary commences officially, and it's probably going to start early next year, we're going to see people prove whether or not they truly care about electability because what was it that centrist democrats and democratic party loyalists said to us progressives back in 2015 and 2016 well look you don't want to roll the dice with a socialist like bernie sanders we want someone who's battle tested like hillary clinton who can actually defeat a republican and now if they truly believe in that sentiment they would back bernie 100 percent in 2020 because look at that 55 to 42 percent. If you truly want to defeat Donald Trump, if that's your number one goal, then the Democratic Party establishment has got to align behind Bernie Sanders. They've got to fall in line now. The same thing they told us, now they've got to take their own advice and fall in line behind the individual best suited to beat Donald Trump in 2020. Because obviously, Bernie would have won. At this point, I don't think you can really deny this if you're a serious person, because when you look at hypothetical matchups between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, he consistently outpaced Donald Trump. I mean, he pulled outside the margin of error, unlike Hillary Clinton in most cases. Bernie Sanders is really the ticket 
to defeating Donald Trump in 2020. So if Democrats truly care about beating Donald Trump and winning, they wouldn't do any shenanigans. We don't need any type of rigging, any fuckery like we saw in 2016. Otherwise, they will hurt our chances collectively, the left and even the center left, of beating Republicans. Will they do it again? I'm not optimistic. I'm not. Because we already see what Tom Perez is doing to basically exclude progressives from the process. He's purging them from the DNC and replacing those positions with party loyalists and hacks within the Democratic Party. So I think that the Democratic Party has got to get its act together. We need to make sure that Tom Perez resigns before the 2020 primary so that way we'd get someone like Keith Ellison in there who would actually be fair. I truly believe that he would be a neutral arbiter, which is all we're asking for. We don't need someone to stack the deck in favor of Bernie. I think that we can win ourselves without any help because now Bernie Sanders has the advantage of more name recognition. And I think that we have a real shot in 2020. So we'll see how this all plays out. It's going to be interesting. Um, I think a lot of centrist Democrats and Democratic Party loyalists are going to be backpedaling on, you know, uh, their need for uh, for us to get a really battle-tested and electable candidate. And they're going to say, no, you know, that's not going to matter now so much. We'll see what they have to say. But look, here's what it comes down to. If you want to defeat Donald Trump, you go with Bernie. He's the safe bet. And not only is he the safest bet, but he is the individual that would most likely catalyze change that we desperately need when it comes to American policy. So we'll see what happens, but um, I'm certainly getting excited. Heidi Heitkamp, John Tester, and Joe Donnelly are conservative Democrats up for re-election this year, and they have a really interesting electoral strategy. So I'm going to tell you what they're boasting about. Well, you know from the title, but <laughs> I'm going to tell you more specifically why they're boasting about a policy that they should pretend they never supported. So according to Sylvan Lane of The Hill, three vulnerable Senate Democrats hailing from states President Trump won in 2016 are touting their work on a new bipartisan banking law, portraying it as proof of their independence in Washington. Democratic Senators Heidi Heitkamp, John Tester, and Joe Donnelly co-authored the bipartisan legislation signed by Trump on Thursday that eases the regulatory oversight imposed on banks and credit unions by the Dodd-Frank Act. The senators say their bill is a prime example of their ability to work across party lines and solve problems, a message they are eager to bring back to voters in their home states. One-size-fits-all rules from Washington have been strangling Montana's Main Street economy and threatening our rural way of life, Tester said, after the House passed the bill on Tuesday, sending it to Trump. When the extremes on both sides of the aisle tried to derail our efforts, we bucked partisan politics and instead found common ground, he said. Now, understand this. The banking industry in this country is deeply unpopular. By broadcasting to voters that you just helped and were really one of the main individuals that catalyzed this effort to deregulate Wall Street further, you're not going to win any voters over to your side, not even conservative voters. And if you do, I can't imagine that that number of voters you're going to win over by boasting about deregulating Wall Street would be substantial. So really, what's their goal here? What are they trying to accomplish in broadcasting something really they should be ashamed about? Well, really... All you have to do is follow the money to get an answer. This is them basically saying to their donors in the financial industry, hey, look what we just did. We just did your bidding. Now pay it forward and donate to our campaigns because we may be in trouble. And as you saw, we delivered. So now deliver for us. And lo and behold, would you look at that? Can you guess who commercial banks have contributed to the most in this election cycle? It happens to be Heidi Heitkamp, Joe Donnelly, and John Tester, the top three recipients in the Democratic Party. I mean, <laughs> they are completely shameless here. This is nothing more than corruption. So when you look at Heidi Heitkamp's top donors throughout her career, they include Goldman Sachs, Signature Bank, Blackstone Group. John Tester's top donors include Blackstone Group, Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo. And while Joe Donnelly himself doesn't have as much career-long ties to commercial banks as his colleagues do, well, he's still rolling in bank money in this election cycle. So this is corruption. 
when you look at the top 20 recipients of political contributions from commercial banks, they're in the top four. So it's very clear what they're trying to do here. They're trying to solicit donations from more commercial banks. That is so disgusting, so shameless, that I don't know how they don't resign in shame because clearly they're broadcasting to their constituents that they don't care at all what they think. Do you honestly think that their constituents, liberal Democratic Party voters, no matter how centrist they are, are going to be excited about the fact that they deregulated Wall Street further, that they loosened banking regulations that Obama signed into law? Really? You think that Democratic Party voters are going to be in favor of that? I mean, what more evidence do you need that they're sellouts? They don't care about their constituents. They're there for self-serving reasons. They're career politicians, and they want to make sure that they extend the length of their career by continuing to rake in cash from the banking industry. It's absolutely despicable. So even though it's obviously the case that Republicans are also equally sold out to big banks, if not more so, these Democrats facilitate Republican victories. They embolden the right because voters see this and realize that Democrats, you know, they're not that much better than Republicans, certainly not better enough to put up with the hassle involved in voting. And they just decide to stay home and not come out to support these corporate Democrats. Because, I mean, if you're only going to be screwed over a little bit less by Democrats than Republicans, then that ultimately makes the hassle of voting not worthwhile in a lot of voters' views. It's probably why voter turnout in the United States is so low. So what party leaders like Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer need to do is they need to show a little bit of tough love for once and try to rein in these rogue Democrats and say, hey, you can't do shit like this because it hurts the party. It hurts our image. It brings down everyone in the Democratic Party. You just can't do it. And they have tools that they can use to get these Democrats to comply. It may not work, but I mean, they can at least try. They could threaten to cut off funding for their elections from Democratic Party organizations. They can threaten that, but they're not doing that. And it's because they like that Democrats like Heidi Heitkamp, Joe Donnelly, John Tester are delivering because they still want donations to be funneled to the Democratic Party from the financial industry. They're all corrupt. It's just that you know, few are willing to openly brag about their corruption, like Heidi Heitkamp, John Tester, and Joe Donnelly. So, I mean, this is absolutely, it's morally reprehensible, and it is overt corruption. And this is, a, this is legal, though. They're not doing anything illegal here. It is, it, it just shows you how broken our system really is and why we need public financing of elections as soon as possible. CNN held another town hall with Nancy Pelosi, who's currently the House Minority Leader, and it essentially reminded me why I can't stand Democrats. It's because they are incapable of giving you a straight answer. So I'm going to show you two clips here. The first one is going to be about healthcare, an issue that is incredibly important to me. So somebody asks her about healthcare, and watch how difficult it is for her to answer this very basic question. I was wondering, as a teen cancer survivor and someone who lost a family member to cancer because they were underinsured, how will you and House Democrats work to ensure affordable health care as a human right as we enter the midterm elections? Thank you. Well, I'm very proud. Uh, I'm sorry for your family's loss and Thank you. Um, thank God that you have survived. We all pray for you. I, with your permission, pray for you. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, I, I'm very, very proud of the Affordable Care Act. When we passed that bill, it was an opportunity of a generation for us to stand with those who did Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and now the Affordable Care Act. It was a compromise. We knew we had to improve it as we went along, and uh, we still have to do that. Uh, but our goal is that everyone will have access to affordable care. What the administration has done is to, uh, to make changes that are going to make premiums be more expensive, and that is going in the wrong direction. We spend lots of money on research in our country at the National Institutes of Health. We believe that those biblical powers to cure should be available to everyone, 
and that means that everyone should have access in an affordable way to health care. Quite frankly, answer to your question earlier, one of the reasons I stayed, I thought if we had a Democratic president, a woman at the table, I could go home, be with my nine grandchildren, uh, if they wanted me to be there, that is. <laughs> they, they sometimes have plans of their own. Uh, the, um, but we didn't win. There wasn't a woman at the table. But more importantly, I knew I had a state to protect the Affordable Care Act, and that is my mission. Yeah. And so, and so we know what we need to do to stabilize the markets. We know what we need to do to make it more affordable and more universally accepted. And, and what the administration is doing, sabotage, sabotage, sabotage over and over again. And that's just really unfortunate because this is not just about good health care, affordable health care. It's about a healthy America. It's about prevention. It's about nutrition. It's about wellness. It's about so many things, but it's also a recognition that health care is a right, not a privilege. And I'll go further and say that the most privileged person in America with all the resources in the world, well, his or her health has a better chance of being the best if the poorest person in our country has access to quality, affordable health care. Because, because when everyone is in the loop, we learn more. We learn more. We learn more about how to prevent, how to uh, care for, and then hopefully how to cure. So thank you for your question. This is a big value. And the fact that in the tax bill, they stripped uh, perhaps 13 million people out by eliminating uh, the, the mandate is, is really almost sinful. So first of all, before I get to Nancy's response, I do want to say that I think that the person asking that question was being a little bit too kind to Nancy Pelosi, and she worded it in a way to give Nancy extra wiggle room, which you don't want to do. She asked uh, how Democrats would work to allow affordable health care as a human right. But what she should have asked is how Democrats are going to work to ensure health care itself as a human right. Because if you believe something is a human right, then you can't be excluded from said human right if you're poor. So access to health care doesn't really mean anything. It's health care, which is the goal that we want. But nonetheless, I'm going to read you Nancy Pelosi's response. Quote, well, I'm very proud. I'm sorry for your family's loss. And thank you. Thank God that you survived. We all pray for you. I, with your permission, pray for you. The I'm very proud of the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> Mother of God, Nancy, just answer the question. Just answer directly. Just go straight to the question. You don't have to compliment her. You don't have to um, espouse any platitudes. I mean, or if you're going to do that, simply say that you're sorry for her loss and then get directly to the question. But there's all, you know, this tap dance around it. And I think really what she's doing is kind of filibustering here. I think she's trying to give herself enough time to think about how she wants to tap dance around the question. And really the question itself, it was framed in a way that allowed Nancy Pelosi, I think, to obfuscate enough to make it seem as though she was in favor of something like universal health care or health care is a right, when in actuality, that's not even how the question was framed. Now, what she gave here was a total non-answer. She essentially said that the Affordable Care Act was great and we still need to improve it, but here's what Donald Trump's administration has done to ruin it. Now, I've said this once, I'll say it again. You can't just talk about what Republicans are doing wrong. You have to come up with solutions yourself. But before she actually ended up getting to her answer, she veered off in another tangent, saying, one of the reasons I stayed, I thought if we had a Democratic president, a woman at the table, I could go home, be with my nine grandchildren, uh, if they wanted me to be there, that is. Such a weird thing to say. Are your grandchildren going to be like, Grandma, fuck off. We don't want to be around you. I mean, this, this is such a weird thing to say. They sometimes have plans of their own. Uh, the um, We didn't win. There wasn't a woman at the table. But more importantly, I knew I had to stay there to protect the Affordable Care Act. And that is my mission. So she then goes on again to talk about how what Donald Trump and the Republicans are doing is sabotage, sabotage, sabotage. That was a quote from her. But she's avoiding telling us what she wants to do to improve healthcare. And look, hypothetically, let's say 
Democrats win back all branches of government, they stabilize the markets, reinstate provisions of the Affordable Care Act that Trump and the Republicans gutted. I mean, look, if that happens, does anyone want to guess what would happen the next time Republicans take over government? They would then attack the Affordable Care Act, gut it, and then Democrats would campaign again on restoring the Affordable Care Act, and it's just going to be a never-ending cycle. So what she's essentially advocating for is the same cycle to be repeated again and again and again. She's not proposing anything meaningful that would actually advance this conversation, and she even explicitly stated, healthcare is a right, not a privilege. But Nancy, the problem with that statement is that it's meaningless when you say it because you do believe that healthcare is a privilege because you don't want to guarantee healthcare as a human right. You want to guarantee access to affordable health care as a human right, which doesn't really mean much. Yes, the Affordable Care Act was a step in the right direction, but under the Affordable Care Act, there were still 30 million Americans that were uninsured. So you didn't mention Medicare for all. You didn't even mention a public option. So you can't say with a straight face that health care is a right if you are not willing to propose legislation or support legislation that would guarantee health care as a right. So with all due respect, Nancy, you're a liar. Someone who thinks health care is a right would advocate vociferously for Medicare for all and not do this tap dance around a simple question and go on multiple tangents about grandchildren and, you know, praying for people. Just directly answer the question. But I mean, she wasn't done tap dancing because uh, she was asked about the NFL players, um, or the NFL rather, uh, and their new policy requiring players who want to kneel during the national anthem to stay in the locker room. And again, she just couldn't give a straight answer. When the anthem comes on, you stand. If you do not want to stand, stay in the locker room. If you come out onto the field and you kneel or you in other ways protest, you will be fined. Are you okay with this rule change by the NFL? I would be more okay with it if they had consulted with the players. Uh, this was, the, it, it was a, I, I don't think the uh, players agreed to this. This was the owners, and by the way, it's the owners who would be fined. I love the national anthem. I mentioned earlier to Jesus that I'm from Baltimore. That's where it was written during the War of 1812. So I'm very possessive of it. Sometimes people say, maybe we should change the national anthem. No. I'm from Baltimore. <laughs> I love the national anthem and I love the flag. Our homes are all decorated uh, with flags. It's such a beautiful thing. Uh, and I love the First Amendment. And I'll just leave it at that. I love the First Amendment. So if you've thought deeply about this issue and you actually have a stance, this is how you answer that question. I'm absolutely against that policy because if it is the case that that flag really is the embodiment of freedom and rights, then making players hide and basically silencing them and wanting to speak out, well, that undermines everything that that flag stands for. But instead, she says, I'd be more happy with it if they consulted the players first. And you see, this is another problem with Democrats. They can never just be against something because of their principles. They can only oppose things based on technicalities. For example, they were against Trump bombing Syria because he didn't consult with Congress first. They didn't speak out against how, you know, bombing them in and of itself was wrong and illegal and against international law. And similarly, Nancy here is against the the NFL banning protests because they didn't consult with players first. Why can't you just state your position without including a hundred different stipulations and caveats? Why can't you just say, I'm against this policy? Why can't you give us a straight answer? And it's why normal citizens don't like politicians. It's because this is slimy. They refuse to answer questions. And that's what we don't like about politicians. That's why Bernie Sanders is so appealing. Because he's not rehearsed. He doesn't consult with polls or uh, listen to focus groups about how he should word things. And that's why Donald Trump was even appealing. Just say what you believe. If you're in favor of what the NFL did, then just say it. Just take a stand. But nonetheless, she didn't. And she did another tap dance. Um, instead, we got another tangent, actually. So she states, I love the national anthem. Awesome. I mentioned earlier to Jesus that I'm from Baltimore. That's where it was written during the War of 1812, so I'm very possessive of it. Sometimes people say, maybe you should change the, na change the national anthem. Nope, I'm from Baltimore. I love the national anthem, and I love the flag. Our homes are all decorated with the flag <laughs> because it's such a beautiful thing. That's, that's kind of weird. Um, uh, and I love the First Amendment, and I'll just leave it at that. This is why their own base loathes them, because they can never say anything substantive. 
And look, to be fair, it's not just Nancy. It's not just Democrats. Republicans do this all the time as well. But I mean, you're really insulting the intelligence of your base with these types of answers. Nancy, we know that you've thought about these things. How could you not if you're so heavily and deeply involved in politics? We know you have an opinion on this. Just tell us. If we disagree with you, we'll disagree with you. But it's insulting to give us these non-answers repeatedly and try to basically pass them off as being meaningful, deep responses. They're not, Nancy. We just want you to tell us the truth. But again, the reason why Nancy Pelosi is having to do this tap dance is because on one hand, the Democratic Party's donors within the health insurance industry don't want the party to come out and support Medicare for all. But on the other hand, she knows that the base overwhelmingly supports this policy. So she's trying to do this balancing act and walk a fine line to make sure that she appeases both sides and doesn't offend anyone. But you can't do that. You can't do that. You have to take a side. And by refusing to get on board with the policy that's morally right, which is Medicare for All, which is supporting the NFL players' need to peacefully protest silently during the national anthem, you are not speaking out. And by default, you are taking a stand against what your own base wants. So... Yeah, there, were, there was more to this town hall, but these were two of the moments that stood out the most to me. So, yeah. If you've been watching The Humanist Report for a while now, then odds are you know about the congressional race going on in the 4th District of Nevada, featuring progressive all-star Amy Valela. So it's important to know that if you support Amy and you live in that district, early voting has already begun and the official election and vote will take place on June 12th. Now, as the race heats up, it's clear that the establishment has chosen their favorite candidate. And no, it's not Amy Valela, it's actually Stephen Horsford, who represented that district before, but was voted out after just one term and then became a lobbyist thereafter. Now, in spite of that, he was recently endorsed by former Vice President Joe Biden, who believes Horseford should represent the voters of CD4 again, even if they voted him out after just one term. Now, Horseford actually touted this endorsement at a recent debate that they had, um, and I think that after watching the debate, Amy Valela did a fantastic job at standing out and communicating to voters that she's really the only progressive option in this race. If you want a true progressive who will be in favor of progressive policies and populist policies, the choice is clear. You have to go with Amy Valela. Meanwhile, her opponents, they said some really interesting things. I mean, it wasn't like they bombed, but for example, one opponent of hers named John Ancelone decided to talk about the importance of compromising with Republicans when he was asked if he'd support Nancy Pelosi's bid to be the House Speaker in the event uh, Democrats are able to take back the House. And this is what he had to say. And compromise isn't a bad thing. Compromise in this chaotic kind of gridlock uh, time right now is a good thing. Um, yeah, no, it's not. Generally speaking, it is the case that compromise is a good thing. But when Democrats use the word compromise, they don't actually mean compromise in the general sense that, you know, normal people use the word. When they say compromise, they mean roll over and die and give Republicans everything that they want. So when Republicans um, or when Democrats rather talk about compromise, you should be skeptical immediately. So when he talked about compromising with Republicans, when he was asked about Nancy Pelosi, that kind of raised some red flags for me. But what I found hilarious is how the establishment's favorite here, Stephen Horsford, who built a campaign on opposing Donald Trump specifically, who claims that he actually decided to throw his hat in the race because he's against Donald Trump and Republicans and what they're doing. Well, watch what happens when he's asked whether or not he opposes one of Donald Trump's most harmful foreign policy decisions. And then watch how Amy Valela swoops in and teaches him how to answer that question properly from the perspective of a true progressive. As someone who's been a strong advocate, uh, an ally of APAC, and who has worked across the aisle to make sure that we come together to preserve the U.S.-Israel relationship. I think that we need to focus on the policy and not so much the placement of the, uh, of the embassy. So would you have supported it or not if you were in Congress? It really wasn't the decision of Congress. I know, but would you have supported the president on this? John, I, I, in all honesty, 
it's a distraction away from the important international issues. Right now, we are faced with uh, conflicts in North Korea, in Iran, and in places all around the world. Okay. And the, to debate whether or not the embassy should be in Jerusalem or not is simply not the priority issue to which you've been talking about at this time. People are accusing me of distractions a lot tonight, Todd. <laughs> Amy Vallella, was it a good decision or not? I think it was reckless of Donald Trump to, to move the embassy after the long-held position we had in the manner he did. It's adding fuel to a fire. And I, I know that both Palestinians and is Israelis both want the same thing that all of us want here, and that's peace, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness for their families. And I think that as allies to Israel um, and also to Palestine, we need to make sure that we are being hel we're helping in that process and not pushing hot buttons and making it worse in those peace processes. <laughs> now note his expert use of the politician hand gesture there. I mean, I think that he's really got it down. Um, but, you know, it's funny because Mr. Anti-Trump can't condemn one of Donald Trump's most harmful policy decisions that inflamed tensions in the Middle East. Shouldn't that be easy for you to come out and condemn Donald Trump? It wasn't just Amy Valeda. Literally every other uh, uh, candidate in this race condemned what Donald Trump did. But an individual who based his campaign off of opposing Donald Trump, well, is proving, like other Democrats, eh, he's not really willing to oppose Donald Trump that vociferously. So, Stephen, what happened to this? I'm disgusted uh, with Donald Trump, with the Republicans in Congress, and their reckless agenda. I mean, really, do I need to say anything else? So, after watching this debate, after following Amy Vlada's campaign, um, I think you know there's a real clear choice in this race. It's Amy Valela. So if you want to help her get elected, please consider contributing to her campaign. It is now crucial at this point in time. I've done so multiple times and I'm doing it again because there's nobody better than her to represent that district and progressives, generally speaking, in Congress. I truly believe in her. So with that being said, if you believe in Amy like I do, you've got to support her. Give anything you can, a dollar, two dollars. You know, you can give the... Uh, uh, $27 donation, whatever you can. Uh, and more importantly, if you live in the 4th Cong Congressional District of Nevada, you've got to get out and vote. You've got to tell your friends. You've got to make sure you do what you can because the establishment has come out against Amy Valela here. They're backing Stephen Horsford. So please, if you support her, you can make a difference. Do what you can. Vote for Amy. Uh, contribute to Amy. Uh, and that's all I got to say. So before we go, I will leave you with one of Amy's final campaign ads that shows you exactly what she's all about. Politics is about life and death, and people are dying in this country because we have too many elected officials who have forgotten why they went there in the first place. So we must send Amy to that Congress. We must send a message to the establishment on either side of the aisle that enough is enough and that any old blue just won't do. We are living in a nation where people are crying out for leaders who will elevate their voices. Amy is such a leader. She is running as a living testimony to what happens when a system fails. I thought that I had reached that point in my life where I finally was living the American dream. But then I learned you cannot have a testimony without a test. My daughter, Shalin, died because she became a victim of our for-profit healthcare system. I know what it's like to have to pay the ultimate price because we have politicians that are not interested in putting the needs of the people first. This isn't just about one person. This is about all of us. I was meeting people who were worried about being deported or having their families torn apart. Parents who were struggling working multiple jobs to just barely provide the basic needs of their children. We have insufficient representation in Washington, D.C. And what I can tell you is that I cannot be bought. This is about the people. This is our time. We can have a true candidate of the people who will not be beholden to the corporate donors and who's going to fight for you. I will fight for you as I have fought for my family. 
watch out. Nevada's 4th Congressional District is sending a representative that is going to raise all cane to make sure that we have people put over profit. I'm Amy Valella, and I approve this message. It's a new week, so do you want to guess what that means? There must be a new scandal from FCC Chairman Ajit Pai, and would you look at that? There is. I really don't know what to say about this guy. So, um, to recap, as of late, we found out that he's also caught up in the scandal involving AT&T and Donald Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen. Um, and now we're learning that he is in bed with the Koch brothers. He's allowing them to, or their cronies more specifically, to set up an office in the FCC. Not even kidding about that. So, as Alex Koch of TYT Investigates explains, two recent employees from key groups financially supported by billionaire industrialists Charles and David Koch are creating a new office within the Federal Communications Commission that will provide economic data and analysis relating to FCC policy initiatives. The office could provide FCC Chairman Ajit Pai with analytical justification for slashing regulations. The two officials launching the new office both have ties to George Mason University, which has been funneling academic conservatives into government roles since becoming a major beneficiary of Koch money. Both have either been employed by or had their academic work funded by the Kochs and by the telecommunications industry. And FCC records obtained by TYT show that one of them met with and corresponded with telecom industry representatives, one of whom was his wife. An email obtained by TYT showed that one of them explicitly hoped to recruit officials for the new office at a telecom industry event. Wow. In 2017, Pai spoke at an event hosted by Charles and his brother David Koch's flagship political nonprofit, Americans for Prosperity. The group praised Pai and the FCC for repealing net neutrality in December. More than half of the anti net neutrality comments of the FCC's second call for comments in 2014 came from a primarily Koch funded group called American Commitment. Pai also spoke at an event co-sponsored by the Charles Koch Institute last year. So, really, Ajit Pai has his hands in all the conservative cookie jars that the country has to offer. Think about how problematic this is. He's allowing Koch brother cronies to shut up, set up shop in the FCC to produce propaganda that would justify and legitimize his repeal of net neutrality. It really doesn't get any more Orwellian than that. These are individuals not just financially backed by the Koch brothers, but the telecom industry itself. They were recruiting people at a telecom event to take part in this new office. And the creation of this new office, mind you, uh, was approved in a three to two vote along party lines because uh, Ajit Pai and his Republican stooges in the uh, FCC voted for it. That includes Mike O'Reilly, Brendan Carr, and of course, the king of corruption himself, Ajit Pai. So, um, this really isn't surprising at all. I think that there's very little that could surprise me about Ajit Pai at this point. Clearly, I don't have to spell out how this is a clear conflict of interest. We shouldn't have people so close to a government agency that they've literally set up shop in a government agency if they came from the industry and they are funded by conservative groups that are against net neutrality. I mean, that's clearly a blatant conflict of interest. But if we've learned anything about Ajit Pai, it's that he doesn't care about the optics of the situation. It's that he wants to make sure that he fulfills his agenda because he knows that even if he's getting, you know, um, a lot of uh, criticism currently, the payoff will be worthwhile when he leaves the FCC inevitably and goes to work for Verizon or, you know, some lobbying firm. So, um, I don't really know what else to say about this. A new week always brings us another story involving a Pie and how he's corrupt or how there's another conflict of interest that diminishes his ability to act impartially. And again, what's so absurd about all of this is that the Federal Communications Commission is a government agency that's supposed to protect consumers. But Ajit Pai basically did a 180. He now has taken the agency in a direction to where they're doing everything possible to hurt consumers. He's rolled back a ton of regulations and protections, the most serious of which being net neutrality. But he's also made poor people's access 
to broadband, you know, uh, a lot more difficult to obtain by cutting off subsidies that they um, received before. So this guy is so just shamelessly corrupt. He doesn't care how it looks. He doesn't care that we continuously bash him for being corrupt. He does not care because, again, if you stand to gain millions of dollars with a cushy new job after you leave the F FCC, I mean, you can you can weather the storm, so to speak, currently, you know, if you know that the payoff will be worth it. So, yeah, um, it's this is really, it's sad. It really is because the FCC has been completely taken over by the industry. This is a coup. Ajit Pai is letting them regulate themselves. How absurd is that? But, I mean, it's not that scandalous because this type of thing happens all the time. We just don't see it. You know, we don't we don't see public officials wear it on their sleeves as much as Ajit Pai does. Conservative actress Roseanne Barr is in a lot of hot water today because she decided to reveal her true colors. Again. But more on that in a minute. So what she did was she decided to attack a senior advisor to Obama's administration, specifically for her looks in a really problematic way. So this is what she said about former Obama advisor Valerie Jarrett in a tweet today. Quote, Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a baby equals Valerie Jarrett. Now, as a comedian, I really expect more. I don't think that that's funny. All you're doing is being a dickhead. And more specifically, you're being really fucking racist. Now, after she made that tweet, even her own co-stars decided to come out and condemn her with co-star Sarah Gilbert calling her comments abhorrent and consulting producer Wanda Sykes announcing that she was quitting the show. Now, criticism from her colleagues is really just a snapshot of the shitstorm she caused with this tweet. Now, after she received a lot of backlash, she did apologize, saying, I apologize to Valerie Jarrett and to all Americans. I am truly sorry for making a bad joke about her politics and her looks. I should have known better. Forgive me. My joke was in bad taste. I apologize. I am now leaving Twitter. But things got progressively worse for her because ABC promptly announced that they were canceling Roseanne. It was just rebooted. And after one season, they chose to cancel it because of what she said. Now, additionally, her talent agency announced that they were dropping her. So, needless to say, her tweet, her attack really, on Valerie Jarrett caused quite a bit of backlash. And justifiably so. But, if you've been following Roseanne, you knew that it was only a matter of time before something like this happened. Before she put her foot in her mouth, said something stupid, and got her show canceled. Because she has a history of saying and doing things that are completely moronic and idiotic. For example, she posed as Hitler baking cookies not too long ago. She recently accused Susan Rice of being a man with, quote, big swinging eight balls. And if you look at her Twitter feed, it's littered with stupidity. It's nothing but right-wing talking points, conspiracy theories. Her feed is reminiscent of the movie Idiocracy, really, because she's clearly a fucking lunatic. But now that Roseanne Barr was fired because she said someone else looks like an ape, conservatives are using this as an opportunity to point out the double standard between the right and the left because Bill Maher, another celebrity, compared Donald Trump to an ape. So the question is, why isn't he being fired? And the answer is pretty simple. It's because context matters. White people calling other white people monkeys isn't the same thing as white people calling black people monkeys because historically, this is how white racists justified oppression against blacks, in part by comparing them to monkeys in pop culture. It was how slavery was justified in some parts of the South, because their contention was that blacks were inferior to whites, and they weren't really on the same level as other humans. So, there was this racist stereotype that perhaps black people were more akin to apes than other human beings. There were old comics and cartoons from the early 1900s depicting blacks as apes, and this trend still continues. It's persistent till this very day. There's a plethora of memes and t-shirts comparing Obama to monkeys. This is a racist stereotype used to belittle, demean, and dehumanize blacks. So to suggest that Bill Maher comparing Donald Trump to an orangutan is in any way similar is completely ignorant. But with that being said, if conservatives really think that we give a shit about Bill Maher, we don't. You can take them. Now, with that being said, the question is, does this violate Roseanne's free speech rights? And the answer is no. You can question whether or not you feel as though ABC was justified in firing her, but 
when it comes to the issue of this violating her First Amendment rights, it would only violate her First Amendment rights if she were fined by the government or locked in jail because of what she said. But ABC, which is a private company firing Roseanne, they are well within their right to do so. I mean, on YouTube, if we so much as say anything even remotely controversial, we get demonetized. There are consequences for the things that we say, even if we feel as though they are arbitrary. But Roseanne said something so overtly racist, even people like Tommy Lahren have come out to denounce what she said, because really there's no way that you can frame this as anything but a racist comment. Now, with that being said, what's crazy to me is that her show was absolutely killing it in the ratings. I mean, it was on par with Game of Thrones. In fact, beating Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead, uh, specifically recent episodes, which blew my mind. I did not understand that because I watched the show because as a child, I grew up and I loved Roseanne. Uh, it was one of my favorite shows, to be honest. And I watched the remake or, or the reboot, rather, and it was dog shit. It was complete fucking garbage. Uh, it came off as pandering. And really, I think that this... this format of sitcoms just taking it and pulling it from the 90s and dropping it into 2018 it doesn't really work i mean this campy corny humor it just it doesn't seem like it fits so apparently i'm in the minority though because everybody else seemed to just love roseanne um and after watching the episode i, I did watch one episode so perhaps it got better you know as the series progressed throughout the season um but after watching one roseanne i decided to go back and kind of rewatch some of the old shows the sitcoms um, that were similar to Roseanne that came on in the 90s, like Step by Step, Home Improvement, Full House, and they were complete fucking garbage too. So it just seems like this this type of humor that we see with 90s sitcoms, it doesn't really seem appropriate for the year 2018. For it to even come close to a show like Game of Thrones, which is amazing, it blows my mind. I don't get it. I think it's just because she was pandering to conservatives, and since it was a show that focused on a Trump supporter, I think that maybe conservatives felt the need to go out of their way to support it as a means of triggering libs. I mean, I really don't know. Maybe people just genuinely like the show and it's just not my type of humor. But these 90s shows are really terrible. And I think that a lot of us just have nostalgia goggles on when we think about them. But, you know, when you go back and you watch them in reality, it's <laughs> it's not what we remember them to be. But I'm, I'm getting completely derailed here. But, you know, uh, I figured why not shit on the show itself and other 90s sitcoms that really should not be rebooted <laughs> now that Roseanne went and fucked it up. So look, at the end of the day, what Roseanne said here is obviously racist. I mean, there are some things that just can't be tolerated. If you allow this type of overt racism to be tolerated from someone as famous as Roseanne, then it becomes more socially acceptable. So you have to take a stand. And that's what ABC did here. And I don't know how... You would justify keeping her on if you claim to be a principled company, which we all know these large multinational corporations and billionaire companies, they don't really care about principles, but what they do care about is their public image. Keeping on a racist is bad for business. So, I mean, Roseanne should have known about this, but again, just look at her Twitter feed. This is not surprising. She has said the most dumb things. She's almost on Ted Nugent's level. Um, so yeah, if Roseanne didn't want to be fired, she shouldn't have said something so hideous. But of course, that's not going to stop conservatives from playing the victim anyway. A recent panel on CNN discussed Donald Trump's barbaric immigration policies, and more specifically, they addressed how the Department of Health and Human Services lost track of almost 1,500 immigrant children. Now, when you hear about this story... I think the knee-jerk reaction from conservatives is that, look, see, this is evidence that government doesn't work. These large bureaucracies, they just don't function well, which is why we need to cut the size of government. But I mean, do you really want to make this argument right now when Republicans are in control of all branches of government? You guys are in control of everything. So if you're saying government doesn't work, what you're implying there is that you don't know how to govern. But nonetheless, this panel was really interesting to watch, and it kind of went off the rails when former United States Senator Rick Santorum essentially said, you know what, it's not really our problem, meh. 
which then resulted in Nina Turner essentially having to teach him about human empathy. So I'm going to show you the clip, but before I do that, I want to provide you with some much needed context because I think there's a lot of confusion about this issue in particular. So according to Amy Wang of the Washington Post, in the recent days, outrage about treatment of children taken into U.S. custody at the southwest border has reached a fever pitch, exploding in a barrage of tweets and calls to action with the hashtags we are the children and missing children. Did the United States really lose track of 1,475 immigrant kids? In short, yes. During a Senate committee hearing late last month, Stephen Wagner, an official with the Department of Health and Human Services, testified that the federal agency had lost track of 1,475 children who had crossed the U.S.-Mexico border on their own, that is, unaccompanied by adults, and subsequently were placed with adult sponsors in the United States. Health and Human Service officials have argued it is not the department's legal responsibility to find those children after they are released from the care of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which falls under HHS's Administration for Children and Families. And some have pointed out that adult sponsors are sometimes relatives who already were living in the United States and who intentionally may not be responding to contact attempts by HHS. Now, is it the case that a lot of these sponsors are just not responding? Sure, that's certainly a possibility, but is it also the case that some of these children are in danger? Yes, that's also a very real possibility. It could be the case that some of them even fell into the hands of traffickers, but we don't know overall, which is why we're concerned. Now, to be clear, the nearly 1,500 children being referenced here and elsewhere, they weren't actually separated from their parents at the border. They arrived at the border alone, as the article stated. But with that being said, children that do arrive at the border with their parents are actually taken away due to a new policy implemented by Donald Trump's administration. So on May 7th, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced that the Justice Department would begin prosecuting every person who crossed the southwest border illegally or at least attempt to prosecute 100%, even if some of them could or should be treated as asylum seekers, as the American Civil Liberties Union has argued. The consequence of this new 100% policy is that children will be separated from their parents as the kids are charged with a crime, even if the adults are seeking asylum and present themselves at official ports of entry. So, generally speaking, families are in fact being separated at the border, but with respect to these children, the 1,500 who were lost, they did arrive by themselves. So I think that that clarification is important. But the fact that we're unable to account for them is extremely problematic, and the response from various agencies has essentially been them trying to downplay the situation, saying, well, you know, they're probably just not returning calls. But I mean, again, it's possible, but we don't know that for sure, and given this administration's treatment of immigrants, I don't think that they give a damn even if these kids were in danger. So that's why Americans with a heart are concerned about these children. It may very well be the case that HHS is correct and, you know, their sponsors aren't responding. That may be, you know, the majority of cases here. But at the same time, they could very well be in danger. The fact is that we want to know and we care. We want to make sure that they're not in danger. We want to make sure that they're not in the hands of traffickers. We care, which is why we are concerned. I think there's a number of conservatives who are concerned as well because a lot of people try to be decent and realize, yeah, it's possible these children could be in danger. And since they were, you know, they came to the U.S., they were in our jurisdiction, it was our responsibility to look after them. But the government's basically saying, eh, not really our problem. So now that you have the context, I do want to get to the CNN clip that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, um, because Rick Santorum essentially echoed what the government has been saying. Eh, really, you know, the parents are to blame and it's not really our problem. And um, Nina Turner, I think, did a really good job teaching him about human empathy. The idea that 100% that of these sponsors are going to check in, of course, that's never going to be the case. There's always going to be a problem. People move. They don't feel, oh, you know, we don't have to check in anymore. You know, we've, we've gone someplace else. So the idea that they're, quote, lost, I think, is an overestimate, uh, is, is, a, is hyperbole to try to, to try to create an issue where I don't really think there is one other than the fact that the bureaucracy, if surprise, you don't surprise, think doesn't work that very 1,500 well. 1,500 children being lost is not an issue, then there's there's something I don't definitely think, wrong. I, I think the idea that they're lost, they are placed with families that have been previously And the government vetted. has said they have lost track of them. That's another word for lost. Yeah. That, that, that doesn't mean that these kids are out, that there are 
logical explanations. And I, again, we're talking about a government system, and we all know Bill and I will sit here forever and tell you how in, in, inadequate a lot of these government agencies are at doing a lot of things. I mean, we we lose people all the time in a lot of other well, government let me, programs. Let, let, me, let me just bring in some, some, it's not just Democrats who are saying this, conservatives also have been outspoken about being upset about this. I want all of us to put ourselves in the place of those mothers or those fathers, or as Patty was saying, we're both mothers. I mean, I can't even dream of a situation where my son would be torn uh, from my arm. With all due respect, in that these way. parents but, are putting their children in peril still, by, I mean, by, text, by putting them in They're and just trying to escape the peril. But they they're they're trying trying may to or may not. Peril. You don't know their situation. Text some books. may be, some, some it may just be an economic issue. There may be all sorts of but reasons Senator, people To come me, here. that's not the point anymore. It is the moral. No, the point is that. It is the point because you want to discourage that behavior. The point is that we have children's lives at stake here. But the parents are putting their children's lives at stake. Let's get to the bottom line. No, the point is that. The parents are putting these children. That in America has by doing a what moral they're doing. obligation right. to those kids yeah. that are that is larger the moral than what the parent the may have done. The moral obligation is to deter that type of activity. That, and the children be damned. The children be damned. You can be. You, you can the the the, At some point, you can the parents the have to take responsibility for their children. We're going to use the children as a pawn. At some point, parents have to take responsibility. Go ahead. You want to get in? Well, I'm just one can believe that some of these parents, some of these parents, may be behaving irresponsibly. One can also believe that as a matter of policy, it is unwise and cruel yes. to take their kids away from them. And there are other ways you can punish. We take That's kids right. away from parents Absolutely. who do illegal acts all the time. And we put parents in jail. We don't lose. We're not losing. Right. We don't kids. lose. We exactly don't lose. right. Well, I, I guarantee What's the excuse parents, for losing these children? I guarantee you, Patty, that some millions, of, these that millions of kids asylum. over the course of this oh country whose parents have been put in jail have been, quote, lost in the system. And you know that to be we true. We can't justify this. I think... I, it cannot be justified, and this president is going the extra mile there, to push this narrative. Should there be? I wish you had the outrage for parents no. who were jailed as much as Mark you have outrage God. for what's going on here. It, Kamala I do, Harris and others have called. outrage I for. I have I outrage about a whole bunch of stuff. So if we want to go down that line, we can. Okay. When I watched that, I couldn't help but think about how Rick Santorum is someone who claims to be a Christian. He's an evangelical. He claims that his religion is a guiding principle for his worldview. But if that's the case. How could you not be concerned about the well-being of 1,500 children that the government lost track of? I don't, I don't get it. Any person who cares about the well-being of others should be concerned about this and should be outraged that we're unable to make contact with these 1,500 children. But especially, I mean, I would expect someone who espouses Judeo-Christian values to be more concerned, right? More concerned than the rest of us, but he's not. So he is a hypocrite. He is unable to follow his own biblical principles here and really you know I, i'm bringing religion into the mix here just to show how big of a hypocrite he is but really this is about human empathy and compassion perhaps all of them are safe we don't know but that's the point the uncertainty is unsettling for individuals who care about these children their children children are unable to fend for themselves like adults so i think that if they came to the united states regardless if it was with or without their parents if they're in U.S. custody, we have to keep track of them and make sure that they're safe. So the fact that Rick Santorum and other Republicans, some, mind you, are just, you know, washing their hands of the issue and saying, eh, I don't really care. It really shows their true colors. They don't care about human beings. They're not pro-life. They don't care about others. And this proves it. Last week, we talked about how Donald Trump was essentially forced to come out and do damage control after people within his own administration, Mike Pence and John Bolton, tried to sabotage peace talks between the United States and North Korea. So to recap, John Bolton talked about how the Libya model might be useful in North Korea, essentially threatening to overthrow their regime, as was the case in Libya. And afterwards, Mike Pence doubled down on that statement. However, after those two warmongers made that comment, Donald Trump came out and assured North Korea and Kim Jong-un that any peace deal will, in fact, include a provision that protects Kim Jong-un. We will not overthrow him. But I mean, regardless, those two neoconservative goons got exactly what they wanted. They pissed off the North Korean regime, which led to a North Korean official named Cho Son Hui to call Mike Pence a political dummy and stated, quote, whether the U.S. will meet us at a meeting room or encounter us 
at nuclear to nuclear showdown is entirely dependent upon the decision and behavior of the United States. And after she made that comment, the very next day, Donald Trump came out and announced that he'd be canceling the meeting and basically threatened to nuke North Korea. Well, many things can happen and a great opportunity lies ahead, potentially. I believe that this is a tremendous setback for North Korea and indeed a setback for the world. I've spoken to General Mattis and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and our military, which is by far the most powerful anywhere in the world, that has been greatly enhanced recently, as you all know, is ready if necessary. Likewise, I have spoken to South Korea and Japan, and they are not only ready should foolish or reckless acts be taken by North Korea, but they are willing to shoulder much of the cost of any financial burden, any of the costs associated by the United States in operations if such an unfortunate situation is forced upon us. Hopefully, positive things will be taking place with respect to the future of North Korea. But if they don't, we are more ready than we have ever been before. Yeah. So, at that point, needless to say, it felt as though all hope was lost until the very next day, Donald Trump gave us another glimmer of hope on Twitter, saying, We are having very productive talks with North Korea about reinstating the summit, which, if it does happen, will likely remain in Singapore on the same date, June 12th, and, if necessary, will be extended beyond that date. And additionally, South Korean Prime Minister Moon Jae-in met with Kim Jong-un at the DMZ to discuss what would make the summit with President Donald Trump a success. And soon after, Donald Trump gave us another update on the summit, essentially saying that it was, in fact, still on, disregard everything he said before, disregard his uh, threat to take military action against North Korea, and he also expressed optimism that it would go well. I just want to mention uh, we're doing very well in terms of the summit with North Korea. Uh, Looks like it's uh, going along very well. Uh, there, as you know, there are meetings going on as we speak in a certain location, which I won't name, but you'd like the location. It's not so far away from here. And I think there's a lot of goodwill. I think people want to see if we can get the meeting and get something done. If we got that done and if we can be successful in the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. It would be a great thing for North Korea. It would be a great thing for South Korea. It would be great for Japan and great for the world, great for the United States, great for China. A lot of people are working on it. It's uh, moving along very nicely. So we're looking at June 12th in Singapore. That hasn't changed. Uh, and it's moving along pretty well. So this is all really difficult to follow <laughs> follow along. So to recap, Donald Trump went from protecting Kim Jong-un or essentially saying that he would protect Kim Jong-un to then threatening to basically bomb North Korea to then saying, you know, I'm actually optimistic about the prospect of peace at this upcoming summit. All of this happened within the span of one week. And really, I wouldn't be surprised if it changed again. And this is all incredibly odd to me. I don't get how Donald Trump is able to so easily oscillate between opposite ends of the spectrum. Most normal people in this situation who announced that they'd be canceling a meeting with a hostile foreign government would only threaten to sever diplomatic talks for the foreseeable future or something like that. But Trump threatened to take military action. He essentially threatened to bomb them. So he's either hot or cold. There's no in-between um, <laughs> there's no meeting Kim Jong-un in the middle. He either wants peace with them or he wants to bomb them. So this level of volatility is embarrassing because it's showing that Donald Trump is incapable of acting like an adult for at least a couple of weeks. He can't refrain from threatening them as he's trying to secure a peace deal. Now, again, if Donald Trump is able to actually, uh, 
do some type of deal with North Korea and get them to give up their nuclear weapons or secure peace in some way, shape, or form, I will give him credit for that. In fact, I am rooting for him here. I hope he's successful because I would love to see peace between the United States and North Korea because, of course, I don't want war with them because that would obviously be a disaster. But with that being said, if you truly care about peace, then you have to act like a fucking adult, Donald Trump, and not go from defending Kim Jong-un to threatening to bomb him the very next day and then changing your mind again. I mean, <laughs> if you can't make up your mind between wanting to bomb a country or be friends with them, then maybe it's the case that you're just not suited for this job. But we all know that Donald Trump is in way over his head. But with that being said, I think that Kim Jong-un is also in way over his head. So, I mean, they're kind of on the same level, both in terms of volatility and intelligence. So maybe it could work. I have no idea. Um, but I just want to say to those of you who came to this video looking for clarity, I, I'm sorry, but I don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> Nobody really knows what's happening in this situation, and it's almost impossible to predict the outcome. Let's all just cross our fingers and toes and hope it goes well, but chances are... Um, Donald Trump is going to change his mind at least four or five more times before the summit actually takes place. But look, we all want peace. It's just a matter of whether or not Donald Trump can act like an adult for at least another couple of weeks. We'll see. So obviously, Donald Trump is viewed as one of the biggest crusaders against political correctness and the PC police. But what he really means is that he's against political correctness to a certain point, because if you say some words that offend him, well, he'll melt like a little snowflake. So watch him talk about how offended he is by Jay-Z's use of the F word. See the crowds, crowds like this, I go one to another to another all over the country. She'd go there. The only way she filled up the arena was to get Jay-Z. And his language was so filthy that it made me like the most clean-cut human being on earth. It's true. It's true. He'd stand up there before those crowds. And by the way, without any musical instruments, I had much bigger crowds than he was drawing. But. But he'd stand up before those crowds and he'd use the F word. And Hillary would sit back, hey, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Oh, please don't have him use that kind of language anymore. And then he'd finish and everybody would leave. And she'd be standing up making a speech to 400 people. I mean, the hypocrisy is absurd. I mean, if you've really built your career or gain popularity because you've taken a particular stance, then shouldn't you be principled and always take the stand of not being offended ever? Well, of course not, because when people like Donald Trump rail against political correctness, what they really mean is that they're in favor of political correctness if it means stopping you from saying things that offend them, but they're against political correctness if it offends you. So they're hypocrites. The right has shown time and again that they don't give a damn about freedom of speech. And furthermore, to specifically reference this clip here, why is Donald Trump still talking about the 2016 campaign against Hillary Clinton? He pretends as though he's still running against Hillary Clinton. Trump, you beat her. It's over. You won. You were victorious. You are the president now. But to him, he never really wanted to be the president. I truly believe that. I think that he wanted to make himself more popular by running. And, you know, when he looks back at the campaign, it's it's nostalgia. That's why he still holds these campaign-esque rallies around the country. That's what he loved. He loved campaigning, but he doesn't like the job that's entailed with winning. He doesn't like governing. I truly believe that. And look, this is me just speculating here, but it seems as though he is just obsessed with the campaign aspect itself. And it's one of the main reasons why I think he even wants to run again in 2020. He doesn't give a fuck about making America great because he hasn't told you what it means to make America great or when America was great and where he specifically wants to return to, you know, in that timeline of American greatness. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's an empty platitude, but it worked because enough people could kind of fill in the blank and think, oh, well, this is when America was great in my view. 
So look, Donald Trump, I don't, I don't, it's really weird that he's still talking about Hillary Clinton's campaign. We all know that Hillary Clinton was a horrible candidate. You don't have to be a conservative to acknowledge that. Progressives like myself still shit on her pretty frequently because she says things that I think are damaging to the Democratic Party. And really, we have a reason to still be critical of Hillary Clinton because she has a lot of sway and influence over Democratic Party politics. But Donald Trump, you know, when he says things like this about the campaign, he just kind of looks like a stalker ex-boyfriend. But, you know, getting back to the broader point about Donald Trump, being a little snowflake. I mean, do you need any more proof that the king uh, who basically rallies the troops against political correctness is a big snowflake himself? I mean, credit to Kyle Kalinske, who always points this out. He sued Bill Maher over a joke. So, I mean, if, if you truly think that people are too politically correct then you need to take your own advice. But Republicans have contradicted themselves and their so-called stance against freedom of speech. I, I don't know how they even can maintain this stance. It's laughable at this point, really. The official death count in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria hit last year has remained just above 60 individuals. However, a new Harvard study is showing that that's not actually the case death caused by Hurricane Maria is a lot higher than official reports are telling us. In fact, it's specifically 70 times higher. And that's one of the more conservative estimates that have come out of this particular study. So according to Haley Miller of HuffPost, the study published in the New England Journal of Medicine found Hurricane Maria left at least 4,645 people dead in Puerto Rico after the storm made landfall on the island on September 20th, 2017. This figure stands in stark contrast with the Puerto Rican government's official tally of 64. The Harvard researchers conducted a survey of 3,299 randomly chosen households across Puerto Rico in which participants were asked about displacement, infrastructure loss, and causes of death. Interruption of medical care was the primary cause of the increase in mortality rates in the months after the hurricane, according to the study. Researchers said their 4,645 estimate is likely to be conservative and the death toll may actually exceed 5,000. Trump repeatedly downplayed Hurricane Maria's disastrous toll on Puerto Rico in the months following the storm. During an October visit to the island, Trump said Hurricane Maria wasn't a real catastrophe like Hurricane Katrina, which left over 1,800 people dead. At the time, Puerto Rico's official death toll for Hurricane Maria was 16. 16 versus literally thousands of people, Trump said at the time. You can be very proud. Everybody around this table and everybody watching can really be very proud of what's been taking place in Puerto Rico. So, needless to say, obviously, that's a gigantic difference. Thousands of people died. And the response from the United States government essentially has been to downplay it. That's what Donald Trump has done. And I actually want to go back to the quote referenced in this article where he talked about how, you know, there's no way that this hurricane is on par with Hurricane Katrina because that was a real catastrophe. Because his comments there really go to show you just how little he cared about the people who reside in Puerto Rico. So take a look. Mulvaney is here, right there, and Mick is uh, in charge of a thing called budget. Now, I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget a little out of whack <laughs> because we've spent a lot of money on Puerto Rico, and that's fine. We've saved a lot of lives. If you look at the... Uh, every death is a horror. But if you look at a real catastrophe like Katrina, and you look at the tremendous hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that died, and you look at what happened here with really a storm that was just totally overpowering. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Now, what is your, what is your death count as of this moment? 17? 16 certified. 16 people certified. 16 people versus in the thousands. Uh, you can be very proud, all of your people, all of our people, were together. 16 versus literally thousands of people. So, this is a huge scandal for Donald Trump. I said before that this was his Katrina, and now, this is its own new category, because if this study is accurate, which I believe it is, then 
the death and destruction caused by Hurricane Maria exceeded that which was caused by Hurricane Katrina. And anyone who's objective realizes that Donald Trump completely bungled this response. Not only did he bungle the response, but he tried to downplay it after it had already happened. This should be one of the biggest scandals in his administration. And upon learning this, since, you know, as human beings, even if he underestimated the death toll of Hurricane Maria, now, what would be the right action to right the wrong? Well, he could take immediate action and do what he can to provide Puerto Rico with assistance and aid. But what has he said about this? At the time I'm recording this video, he hasn't said anything about this. This is the President of the United States. Thousands of people died, and he really, for the most part, has shrugged. The new study comes out showing that thousands of people died as a result of Hurricane Maria, and this isn't a big deal, apparently. Now, according to Donald Trump, the reason why we weren't supposed to be as concerned with Hurricane Maria is because at the time when he made those comments, the death toll was just at 16. But now that the death toll is in the thousands, potentially more than 5,000, why isn't he treating this with the concern that's required? It's, it's absolutely really upsetting to see that people in Puerto Rico are completely being left behind by their government. I mean, I don't know what to say about this. I think people certainly need to know, but there needs to be an urgency still till this day when dealing with Puerto Rico, but we have not seen that. We've seen nothing but incompetence from this administration, and it's, it's, it's despicable. I don't know what else to say. This is incredibly upsetting. You know, this should be something that Donald Trump can take and learn from, but of course, he's just choosing to uh, ignore it altogether. I'm here with David Hildebrand challenging Dianne Feinstein for her Senate seat in the state of California. David, how's it going? Great. Uh, busy, been all over the state, but I'm happy to be on. Glad to have you on. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what made you challenge Dianne Feinstein? Because I think there is, there's probably like thousands of reasons why she is not a progressive or even a liberal. But what made you ultimately decide to run? Um, the, the the final uh, thing in the very beginning was that no one else was, was willing to go against her. So you probably already are aware that I started running in March 2017. And we were filling up slots for our locality, all the districts that I live in, with people to run against various people that we wanted to replace. So all those slots were basically full. Um, and no one was going against Feinstein. So I decided, you know what, if no one's going to go against her, then I'll run. And so in March, I went ahead and threw my hat in the race because I believed that we needed a corporate free option on the ballot. And I knew as a progressive, we needed to start very early and get our footprint, you know, very wide to where we could actually have a chance against, you know, Feinstein's billions or millions at least that she's going to put into her own uh, election fund. Right. I know that she's self-funded, I believe, like five million or something just crazy like that. So, um, yeah, that, I think that's smart to get started early. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about yourself um, and specifically like your background, your career, any previous political activism. Um, what what do we need to know about you specifically? Yeah, so I have a ton of experience in legislation. First of all, I graduated at Sac State with a political science degree. They call it government there. Uh, I just like to specify that. Um, but it's the same degree. Um, I went through an internship with AFSCME, which is a union. I was lead legislative intern there, was there for over a year. It was a full-time paid position. So we dealt obviously with labor issues, um, especially like in-home uh, health services and stuff like that. Um, after that, I actually started working for the Department of Motor Vehicles um, as a legislative analyst there. So I've been doing that for seven years now. So if you put a bill in front of me, I can basically digest the whole thing, tell you the fiscal impacts, the policy impacts, whether it's good or not, whether it solves the issue or whether it's a waste of money. And a lot of times we have uh, legislators because of deadlines throw stuff against the wall to see what sticks. And it's really not a good idea at the end of the day. So you'll see a lot of bills die going through the process. 
So uh, I'm actually in depth into that you know, system right now on the state level. So I would just be transferring that to the federal level. Um, for activism, I've been, as you can see behind me, you can see a few of my posters up, but I've been in the field and in the streets for, for many different issues, for rent control, uh, for police reform, um, a lot of different issues, especially like single payer healthcare. I've been actually debate, I debated single payer healthcare 12 years ago in college and I've been a proponent ever since. So the, the main reason I worked for Bernie, which is the next thing is, uh, was on the Bernie Sanders campaign uh, here in Sacramento area. The main reason I was is because of single payer. I started off phone banking. I hate phone banking, so I went immediately to canvassing. Uh, ended up being the canvas lead for my precinct. When we were done walking and knocking every door in our precinct, I went on to the, uh, the county office and then on to the Bernie Sanders office when the official campaign came in town and became the staging location director uh, for the co entire Congressional District 6, which is a huge district. Um, we knocked uh, quite a bit there, and I was the guy who headed out that effort and actually got the people to the door. So that was over 70 hours a week in the Bernie Sanders office on top of a full-time job, which is the legislative analyst position. So not only do I have the experience and the education in the legislative side, but also in the campaign side. Um, after that, I helped out with a uh, local school board campaign because I really didn't have an interest in the general election um, when it came to president because we didn't have anyone in the game. Yeah. Um, so I helped out with a local progressive uh, race. Uh, after that, I jumped on the SB 562 campaign. Uh, I re-registered as Dem because one thing I didn't say is I actually was part of the Dem exit movement early on uh, right after the California primary. I re-registered DAM and helped out with the ADEM elections, vetting different candidates from all over the state, all the way down to San Diego for ADEM positions within the party to try to take over the party. Um, I promoted Kimberly Ellis when she was running for the chair here in California to take over the party. She came within less than 60 votes of taking that position, which would have completely revamped the whole party in California. So I've been in this for a long time. I go out to the streets, shut down the arena for Stefan Clark. You know, I don't mess around. I'm the activist that gets out there. I don't change the way I do things because I'm running for office. I continue to do the same things. So we're down there facing off of the police, you know, at the arena, shutting it down to send a message. And I don't care if that gets bad press. That'd probably actually help me. But if that <laughs> gets bad press, then that gets bad press. But we need to get the message out there that we can't stand for this sort of brutality anymore. Right. I wanted to ask you kind of about the press situation, um, because it seems like there's the way that it's portrayed in media is that there's only one progressive in the race and it's not you it's not allison hartson it's kevin de leon that's how if you look at articles in politico he's mentioned as the progressive so i asked allison hartson about the media blackout and i wanted to ask you the same thing because you are two very progressive people running but the only individual who is even referenced at all as someone who's progressive is kevin de leon so can you explain is Kevin DeLeon progressive? I know that he's probably to the left of Dianne Feinstein, but he's nowhere near a standard progressive like Bernie Sanders, is he? So basically, um, he has had a whole entire career of accepting corporate donations. Um, he has accepted cor corporate donations in this race. His campaign and his, uh, his uh, subordinates and whatnot will tell you he hasn't, but actually uh, someone questioned me when I said he was a corporate candidate on Twitter and I produced two different uh, corporate donations just within five minutes of searching that he's taken for this campaign. So in past in the Senate you, or the state Senate, he accepted money from Raytheon even. So, wow. I mean, if you're, if you're taking money from corporations like that, then they already have their foot in the door, whether or not you claim to be progressive now. So at the end of the day, is he progressive related to Feinstein or relative to Feinstein? Yeah, he's a progressive in that light. But when I define progressive, the number one thing I look for is corporate free. Yeah. Um, as for the media blackout, if you don't have a ton of money, or sometimes even if you do, but you're not in the inner circle, you won't get it. Mm. You won't get any media coverage. And you can see actually how biased it is by looking at who the newspapers and news agencies are endorsing. So like LA Times and Sac B, you know, Sac B, my hometown, both endorsed Diane Feinstein. So, you know, it's the same power, you know, center in the same, you know, position doing that. Um, the thing I take issue with is when progressive media organizations only support one candidate in each race when there's multiple candidates in the race. 
So that's also an issue we need to address. Um, we, I understand slates and understand, you know, groups getting together to endorse, but if we're going to be a media organization, we should cover everyone. That includes people like uh, Patrick Little, the neo-Nazi, you know, include everyone. Because when we include people like that, it automatically undermines their campaign. And then we can take forward, you know, the, the actual positive progressive people that actually are going to make the change in California. Sure. Um, with that regard, um, do you think that the same type of media coverage should be extended to independents and Green Party candidates, too? Yes, I'm open to any parties. Uh, um, basically, we have different uh, efforts going on right now in different parties going forward. As long as we're going forward and not slitting each other's throats, I think that's great. Right. We all are on the same platform, basically, the Green Party, progressive corporate free Democrats, even peace and freedom and independence. We're all on the same you know, boat. We just need to make sure we're going forward and not punching to our sides and knocking each other out of the races. Like in my part, in my uh, what's it called? My race for U.S. Senate, there's no Green Party candidate. Hmm. So I was hoping that Greens would jump on board and, and you know, support a progressive candidate in the race. But instead, they went and joined with Peace and Freedom and supported a candidate that, you know, is actually not viable and can't campaign because they don't have any money. Hmm. So, you know, that's where we start slitting each other's throats. And we can't win on that basis by the by our own votes, basically. So there's this mentality on some, in some of the left that we can win just with our votes, and that's not the case. Right. So we need to we need to reach across the aisle. We need to develop coalitions and build coalitions across California that put forward people not dependent on their party. So to to show that I'm actually reaching out to the different parties, I've actually endorsed a Green um, mm -hmm. and three Independents. So Gail McLaughlin being the most notable one, she's also endorsed me in my race. So we co-endorsed. So, you know, that's that's the importance that I'm putting on this is I don't care if I'm going to get kicked kicked in the in the teeth by the party for endorsing outside of the party because there's no rules against it. And we currently have Democrats who are endorsing Republican sheriffs and DAs in California, well known, quote unquote, progressive Democrats who are doing this. So if anyone wants to say anything against me for promoting Gail McLaughlin, I'll just tell them, you know, take a hike because they're promoting, you know, DAs and sheriffs who are shooting, you know, African Americans in the street who have cell phones in their hand or in their own yard. Right. So these are the kind of people that are being promoted by Democrats, you know, in the leadership of the party. So we need to reach across those aisles and actually make a unified force on the left. Otherwise, we're not going to win at the end of the day. What prompted you to run as a Democrat? Because you mentioned Dem exit, and I know that party label isn't necessarily um something that you care about, and it's certainly something that I don't care about either. So what do you think the benefits are with running um, in the Democratic Party, even if they typically like to stack the deck against progressives? Yeah, so it's a California thing. Um, basically, when I started off, I had the option to run independent or Democrat. Um, the, the most of the uh, actual force behind the progressive movement in California is running as a Dem enter inside the party. And there's very little going on outside the party. There is some really forceful efforts, but just the numbers aren't there. So running Democrat um, inside the party as a corporate free progressive was actually the only way to really go. Um, and also in California, basically people vote Democratic, even if they register something else. So we have a lot of people in California registered no party preference. It's like I think it's like 37 Democrat, 25 Republican for percentages, and then the no party preference, I think it's bigger than Republicans now. Wow. It, on election day, they all voted for Hillary at 60% to like, I think it was 60% to like 27% uh, for Trump. So at the end of the day, they still vote Democrat, even though they're not necessarily in the party. So having that D next to my name was actually strategic. Mm. Now, um, a candidate like Gail McLaughlin, she doesn't need, you know, to go through the extra loophole of doing that necessarily. I actually talked to her about that early on and she chose the independent route. However, she has history behind her and name recognition already. And she used to be a green. So to get, you know, a lot of endorsements from other organizations and other parties, hers was the best way to go or independent was the best way to go for her. So see, there's a, it's, it's basically just a strategy at the end of the day. So if Dem Enter doesn't end up working in California over the next couple of years, that strategy may change and we may do something completely different. But at this point, I really think that Dem Enter is the way to go, at least until we find out what happens in the next chair race. 
So we're really pushing hard to take over the Democratic Party. Like I mentioned, we're within 60 votes of doing that. So we just need to push forward. And when we get uh, progressives, actual progressives into office, they have appointed delegates that can then take over that system. So that's one of the reasons that people right now are running for office is uh, because they'll get the delegates allotted to them through the Democratic Party. Mm. So we can actually vote with our delegates against the corporatists and the party. And remember, we only need, you know, less than 60 votes more to get that chair seat. So that's what we're really looking at right now as a strategy. So it's an in, inside outside strategy. Uh, one inside the party taking it over and two outside the party, how people actually vote. Right. And you also probably avoided the inevitable, but he's not a Democrat uh, argument from establishment yeah, figures. And, and for me, I wouldn't really, I would love to get that sort of attention from the news media telling everyone <laughs> I'm not a Democrat, but it's not going to happen. Um, they're well aware, uh, Democrats and the news media are well aware that California is very much a no party preference state. It's the fastest growing voter registration is no party preference. So, I mean, if, at the end of the day, that would actually be good for my campaign for someone to, you know, say, you know, he's not a Democrat. But at the same time, when it comes to the average voter, they're not going to probably see those news pieces, even if they did exist. And they're going to vote based on what they see on the ballot and based on their own research when it when they get their ballot. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you about because you're running in the Democratic Party, theoretically, when you choose to run in one of the two major parties or really any party, there are a lot of benefits that are entailed with that. You get access to voter data, for example, NGP Van. Um, you get access to different resources and tools that can help you. Um, have you felt as though the race has been fair? Because I've spoken with um, progressive candidates across the country in mm -hmm. Washington um, and I've been told that they don't feel as though the race is fair, like they've got their access to NGP van cut off or they made them jump through hoops. Sarah Smith in Washington is an example. Do you feel as though it's been fair? Um, it hasn't been fair, but not for the reasons you stated. In California, we don't use NGP van on the party level. Mm. And also the party does not give free access to software to any candidate. OK, So from the get go, we're not even there, basically. So we have a different, a completely different system for profit based system that you have to pay to use. So it's actually mm. cheaper to use products outside of that system. Right. Um, a lot of people don't even like the system we have. So I forget, mm. I even forget what it's called because no one even uses it. <laughs> so uh, people use, you know, private, private vendors that are, that are cheaper than that. The voter file, like I got the statewide voter file from the secretary of state's office for 30 bucks. Mm. So that's not, the issue isn't the voter file. The issue is paying for the software. That's where it gets really expensive. Um, as for the not fairness aspect of it, you basically, you have to have a ton of money to run for office. So if you want to even apply for um, the party's endorsement for U.S. Senate, you have to pay $1,000 in application fee. Um, if insane. you want a table at one of the e-board meetings, it's 500 bucks. If you want a table at convention, it's $1,500. bucks. Um, just to get on the ballot in California for a U.S. Senate race, it's $3,480. And to put a full candidate statement in the uh, voter guide, it's $6,250. Wow. So right now, we're already looking at $15,000, $20,000 just to do the bare minimum to apply for an endorsement with the party and just to get on the ballot and in the voter guide. So, so these are expenses, you know, the grassroots campaigns like mine, we can't just pull all that off and, you know, still travel around the state, you know, and visit different groups. So we focused a lot more on traveling around the state and actually talking to people. We've been to like Chico eight times. We've been to Southern California. I think it's like 30 times now. Um, Bay Area, all over the place, Central Valley, um, all far Northern California. On Saturday, I was in Mount Shasta and Redding. Um, Sunday, I was in Chico. I've been to Eureka even. So we've been all over the place. Wow on really, really small funds. So I think what we're building right now is a blueprint for progressive campaign. So even if you have more money, you don't necessarily need to use that money. So it's it's about budgeting, you know, wisely and, and making choices, you know, hard choices when you have to. Right. Now, I do want to ask you, um, because I know that you're progressive. And for the most part, we probably agree on every policy. Um, mm -hmm. But if you were elected, what do you think would be your policy priorities? Because this is something that I always think about for myself. Like if I were elected hypothetically mm -hmm. to the Senate, I don't even know where to begin. So what do you think you would start with? What would be a couple of policies that you would prioritize? 
Yeah. So number one for me, it's because it's my personal pet project, basically a single payer. I would co-sponsor any single payer bill that was put forward. Obviously, uh, there's a couple of different ones put forward now, mm -hmm. um, Bernie's and Conyers bills. Um, so I'd co-sponsor any bill that's already in for single payer. And if there wasn't, then I'd author one myself. Nice. Um, that's good so that's my number one goal. And the reason why that is, is because my number two goal is getting corporate money out of politics. Mm. But I think there's enough of a movement behind single payer that we can actually pass that legislation before we end corporate money into politics. Yeah. And that's a lot longer of a battle. So as I said, number two, or it's not even number two, they're pretty, pretty even basically in my eyes. Um, getting corporate money out of politics and not just by ending Citizens United, but by instituting publicly funded elections and by taking corporations and union donations out of, uh, out of the system. Because if we only do corporate donations in a publicly funded election system, then that'll never pass because the other side won't allow it to if we still allow union donations. So um, what I'm talking about is like a separate fund that money goes into and that is used for candidates in different races. So what we would have to do in this situation, in a publicly funded election situation, is have higher signature requirements for different offices. So like right now, to get on the ballot in California, I only have to get 100 signatures. Hmm. So we would have to raise that, you know, to, to make sure that people actually had popular support. And that would also tamp down on the, the case. Like right now, we have 32 people in my race. We have 27 people in the governor's race. So it tamps down on having too many people on the ballot because a lot of people just want to put their name on the ballot mm -hmm. just for the heck of it. So they'll drop the money to put their name on the ballot. And that's the end of their campaign, basically, is just getting on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So it, it really waters down the votes at the end of the day, and they're really not real choices. Right. So a single payer and, uh, and getting money out of politics, but also uh, establishing a public finance election system. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of other issues that, that I want to push forward at uh, tuition free college and trade schools and uh, a fair living wage, basically uh, starting at $15 an hour to have a, a more detailed plan about that as well. But those would be the top two. I like it. It sounds good. So tell us before we leave where we can find you. And um, if there's any way we can help, if somebody is listening and what you said resonates with them, um, are we able to phone bank for you or canvas for you? What can we do to get involved? Yeah, definitely. So uh, through my website, you can sign up to volunteer. But since we're like literally 11 days out from Election Day, right now we're just put throwing everything out there. So mm -hmm. if you email us at info at davidforcalifornia.com, which is the word for, not the number, uh, we will actually send you a big stack of flyers and you just go out and just plaster everywhere you know that's a good area. Um, the reason why we're doing this at this late hour on top of our regular canvassing is because during the Bernie campaign, there was a lot of complaints from local activists how the Bernie campaign came in and kind of told everyone where to canvas, and the locals knew where the good spots were to canvas and who they could actually win over, and they were ignored. Mm. Um, this happened in Sacramento. This happened in Alameda. So during that process, you know, a lot of doors weren't knocked that could have been swung to Bernie. So what we're doing now is we're giving volunteers both the, the typical canvassing operation and then the knock every door operation where we just literally give you materials and say, go. If you know what to do, we're not going to question it. Go, because we want to make sure everyone's included. We want to make sure all the doors that people believe should be knocked are knocked. So like I mentioned, info at davidforcalifornia.com to get materials. We'll send out a stack of flyers and a stack of bumper stickers. Well, that's all I got for you guys. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far on the show, I truly appreciate your viewership. And also, I want to send a thank you to our guest this week, David Hildebrand. Next week, we will have Levi Tilleman on the program, who, as you all know, is the uh, progressive Democrat running in Colorado and the second highest ranking Democrat, Steny Hoyer, basically put pressure on him to drop out in favor of the corporate Democrat. So I'll talk to him. Hopefully he can give us the inside scoop there. Uh, but yeah, that's all that we've got this week. Thank you all so much. As usual, I'm going to send a huge thank you to all of our Patreon and PayPal contributors. Uh, you guys keep this show alive and well. Thank you all so much. I'll see you next week. Take care.